I love about this is this is now my seventh, seventh episode. I don't think it get. I don't think I'm getting any better at it. Like, I don't think I'm getting any more professional. So that's great. Hi, but I did, I did remember to bring an actual whiskey glass tonight. So you know what? Maybe I am getting a little bit more professional. You never know. Or maybe professionalism is just overrated. How are you all? I am just getting myself ready. This is Oban. I'm still working. I would like everyone to know I am still working on the same bottle of Oban from when I started this interview series and it's not empty yet. So I feel like I should probably get some kind of credit for that. But yeah, this is not getting any more. I almost just spilled whiskey. That is so much scotch. Oh my God. I almost spilled whiskey all over my table. So just to prove a point, I am not getting any more professional about this. Hold on, Rachel, I've got you. I've got you, Rachel. I've got it. We're professionals. Rachel Hawkins. Victoria Schwab. Oh my God. What's up? I was just saying how this is like our, my seventh interview and I'm not getting any more professional. Like, I thought <laughs> I'd get better at this. What is professionalism? I mean, I my phone is like stacked on my husband's to be red pile on his nightstand because the internet doesn't work in my office. So um, it's stacked on three jigsaw puzzles. Um, nice. It, I mean, I'm under a staircase. So we do what we gotta do to get by. Yeah. I so, did bring a whiskey glass night though. Are you drinking a mint julep? I am out of an actual julep cup. That was my uh, one like nod to professionalism. This uh, is where we're really killing it as adults. We are so professional right now. My last four ones I think have been out of teacups. So really. <laughs> fair. fair. Yeah, but we have the right glassware. And honestly, that's going to get us far in life. I you feel. Know, we're not allowed to start talking anything professionally yet because we're both early. So, right. Well, that's, I, that's really classic us as well, though. That's also super professional, though. I know, I know. <laughs> if you're on time, you're late. This is some southernness, <laughs> though, because southern, like southern yeah. will not let you be late. Ever, ever. I, no, like I said, I if you're on time, you're late. Yeah. So. Also, is your hair purple? Okay, so it was purple, and then it sort of started because it was bleached before I yeah. purpled it. And then it kind of started fading to this, like, grayish color, which I don't I actually it. have any gray hair. Yeah. But it looks nice. I like it. So I'm going like to run with it. One of my best yeah. friends, Jenna, she dyes her hair purple using only, like, blueberries and blackberries. Oh, like, you can do it naturally with, like, beet root yeah. and blueberry and blackberry juice. Yeah. You know, like, in the apocalypse, it seems like a total waste of blueberries and blackberries, but... <laughs> <laughs> like, that was fine in the before times, but right. now, like, we need those homesteading skills for other things, Jenna. <laughs> I mean, also, so, like, my parents, I'm in France with my parents, and, like, they have a garden, but I keep going into the garden each day, and there's, like, one strawberry, and I'm like, well, I guess yeah. that's my snack for today. I would never... And uh, John it. has, like, gone crazy, because John had already, like, was taking a semester off and just kind of doing his own thing. Yeah. And so he's building us a deck. Yeah. And now we also have like all these planters full of vegetables. So we have about 9,000 radishes coming up. And I'm like, I don't really I guess know what to do with radishes. I don't really like radishes, but apparently you can like slice them and put salt on them. I don't know. And they're really good on tacos because they add like a little spicy crunch to a taco. Yeah. And that's nice. But other than well, that... We bought pandemic chickens, which we already had oh. four chickens, but two of them had stopped laying eggs. They like, re apparently mm -hmm. chickens retire, um, mm -hmm. but they just stop. And then my yeah. mother, we can't kill them because we named them no, and that's they're old awesome. to eat. And so like, we just bought four more chickens. <laughs> so now it's we have be like a an entire pandemic brood. Also, hello and welcome to everybody who's joining us. <laughs> we're fine. We're just chatting. We're just I catching know. up. I had to do a professional thing early. Not that this isn't professional, but I had to do like a, a Tolkien lecture symposium thing earlier. And yeah. that's not nearly as fun as this. No. Like, I couldn't drink but during it and they were all academics. And I do have a bunch of Tolkien books actually in this TBR pile right now that are John's because he's like a mess of Tolkien geek. Oh and God. I like you have like actually never read. I read The Hobbit as a kid. 
Yeah. And that was it. Like, it was, I, the same thing. I like, couldn't find the way in. You know, yeah. I was like, there's not enough ladies in this. No, <laughs> I mean, and the thing is, I like got asked to give that lecture series. And my theme of my lecture was, I have never read Tolkien and here's why I never will. <laughs> and it went over like a bag of bricks. So your ovaries are massive. And that's yeah. why I you know, like stood up there in front of an <laughs> academic panel and was like, not my bag. No, but I think that that's, like, really useful, though. I mean, I, like, I watched your speech on YouTube, and I was like, fuck yeah, so. <laughs> it's like, yeah, so I read it. It's fine. Aside from building decks, and by building decks, I mean watching John build decks. How watching are you John build decks. You know, like, how are we all doing right now? Um, I have a book due Monday, so that's been, <laughs> it's going well, actually, because it's a fun book to write. But it's been very surreal trying to work on something really intensely without all of my normal pre-pandemic yeah. crutches, like Is coffee this, shop. I know, the coffee shop's my biggest crutch. I will tell you, I thought nothing will ever replace the coffee shop. And then I had the Rainy Mood app on my phone. Oh, yeah, I, love I didn't it. realize yeah. it has a coffee shop setting. Oh, okay. I'm looking at that then. It's like background barista noises and, and coffee shop chatter. And I thought, this will never help. And then like seven hours later, I looked up from my work. So apparently. Yeah. Okay. Excited. That's good I to know. Pubs. I want a cocktail more than anything else in this world, which yeah. I know is like peak privilege. No, I get it. But it's the same way. Like, you know, John was actually supposed to be in Scotland right now hiking and then we were going to meet him in Iceland in like a week. And I was really looking forward to like just sitting in this house in the middle of nowhere in Iceland and working on the next book. And like, and I get it. It is. It's absolutely privileged. It's certainly not the worst thing going on, but it's a bummer, you know? Yeah. It's, so. hard. it's hard. I I mean, like I'm, I'm so fortunate to be the app for anyone asking is called rainy mood. It's the best app ever. Cause you can it's create really forms and see sounds and also just like a coffee shop and it's beautiful. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I'm supposed to be in Scotland. I had two months of this year blocked out to sit at home and write. And um, yeah. I came down to France the day that the lockdown started. And so I brought like eight articles of clothing because. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, yeah. and so I keep just like stealing my mom's clothes. And so like my, <laughs> I basically look like a bag lady all the time now because I wear mismatched things inside out. Like I just. I'm living my own truth, is what it is. I'm living my own That's reality in which I... Basically what we're all doing. I'm the insane... Like, I just am... I am the person who just... Yes, I am still in France. I live here now in this place under the stairs, uh, which isn't even my right parents' house. I can't even do a tour because it's not... It's the house next door to my parents' house. Okay. Which they bought to make into an Airbnb. And That's smart. We, we, it was an Airbnb for several years and then COVID. And so I yeah. use it as my office space because mom can't get any money for it and I refuse to pay her for it. And so I like cloister <laughs> over here and work <laughs> and do all of these things. But, um, but otherwise, the son is good. The son is good. Yeah, he is, you know, he's 14 now. Um, so he just finished up his online schooling. Which was nice, though, because, like, he's right at the right age where you can be, like, I'm not doing anything with your online school. So, like, here's your school-issued iPad. Go nuts. Like, you do what you're supposed to do. And if you fail the eighth grade, there you have it. <laughs> Consequences are learned. But, no, so he's doing great. I mean, although the other day he was, like, I just really want to see my friends. And he's very introverted. And, you know, he plays yeah. video games and talks to friends online and all that. But he was still like, okay, I've had a all. Yeah. I hate everyone, but I still had a moment where I was like, I almost said something egregiously inappropriate for the internet, but I did have a moment where I was like, <laughs> like, is girl going to get to go on another date ever? Like, I mean, oh my God. Like, I was coming into 33 real hot, and all of a sudden, yeah. my brain's just like. There's no. <laughs> That is, it is hard to be single people. Like, the married people, we do have a limitless supply of that. Yeah. <laughs> of course, the thing is, no one wants it, though. We're like, oh, uh, God. That thing disgusting, quite frankly. So. The unpredicted consequence of, like, the <laughs> pandemic is I was like, whoa, I really should have gotten, like, a lot of rocks off a lot sooner. Right? <laughs> you yeah. really should have. 
<laughs> but a lesson has been learned. <laughs> also, I was thinking about the fact when you said your son's age, that we, I don't think yeah. a lot of people who are watching this right now know we have known each other for a very oh my gosh. long time. Over 10 years now. Yeah, yeah right at 10. With Holly. I've been with our agent for 10 years. Yeah, so it's definitely been before that. So it's probably since like 2009, I'm guessing. Good Lord. Or there's the bell. Yeah, Which yeah, is, yeah, yeah. Really 2009, 2009. Yeah. It's been so seven we years since we went to Scotland. Yeah. Which is crazy because that seems like it was yesterday. Yeah, we went um, to Scotland um, and we went to a Viking exhibit and we discovered <laughs> the um, the hell clock, like the doomsday clock in the museum. Yeah, technically called the Millennium Clock at the it's National the Museum of Scotland. And it, it's the most demonic thing. I've ever seen in my life. And like Victoria was like truly traumatized by it. Well, like was I was so like awful. bad. She was like, we have to go. Well, it started <laughs> so, gonging and it starts, it's like a giant wooden clock that starts <laughs> rotating and showing scenes of ex insane depictions of like torture and, and murder and such, which is normally like, my like, bag. Yeah, but it's like pregnant, like men giving birth while wrapped in barbed wire. So there was it just was a lot of like, whoa. It was a lot. Whoa, it, it like, was a lot. It was all the torture while people gave birth that I was really yeah. like, Ugh. I remember, um, well, I remember feeling, because this is the National Museum in Edinburgh, and I remember thinking, like, this is like the internet in a museum, because you walk from, like, 18th century French art into, like, an exhibit of, of a, a nature exhibit with, like, a lot of plasticine animal bodies. Right, and then there would be, like, and here's a typewriter on the wall, and here's Dolly the sheep, and, you're, like, your brain couldn't take so, any of it in it was too much but we went to a viking exhibit there and then, yes and then we each got a viking coin from the gift shop and then we went to the fire and tits festival which is beltane yes which I amazing fire and, tits, and i'm a pagan and i mean absolutely no disrespect when i say it but it takes no, place same. on calton hill at midnight in front of a bonfire it's the most incredible experience in the world there's a lot of fire and a lot of tits and, uh, so many, and it's morning. cold. It was so cold, and so many people had their whole tits out <laughs> and their whole asses out. Like so many people were so naked, and we were like in coats with boots. Uh, was, we're not getting good food. Um, I watched an American college student piss on yes. the hillside, and then a yes. drunk Scotsman uh, basically be like, "Pull your pants up and have some goddamn respect." <laughs> and then the next day. Even though the weather was terrible, we felt like we were being tested by the universe, and we decided it's to us. Yeah. 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 yeah, and we buried Viking coins. That is also will always be burned in my memory because that's the trip where I started writing a darker shade of magic. That is right, you did, and you were telling me. I still remember you told me, like the whole bit about like Lila, um, Lila. Yes, yeah. Okay. I was like, I had a moment yeah, like yeah, tying yeah. Kel. It's been a while since I've read it. Yeah, Kel and Lila. <laughs> And I killed and Lila and like her like tying him up and that whole thing. And I was like, girl, it's so good. And they got a smooch. And you were like, oh. I don't know if they smooch. And I'm like, girl, they got a smooch. They and did not they... smooch. They didn't there, no. On like the last. They smooch they later, which is better. Yeah. Yeah. This is the main difference between our books. In mine, you always got to earn that smooch. Like it's going to put you yeah. through all the hell first. So Mine is always like. We smooched and now everything is ruined. <laughs> so like, what do we do now? We survived, so you can have a yeah. smooch now. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Mine is like, what have we wrought with our smooching? So for, <laughs> the book that you have due on Monday is this under? Yeah. Is this a Rachel Hawkins book or is this an Aaron Sterling book? This is an Aaron Sterling book. So this is my first romance novel, and that's crazy. Um, <laughs> and yeah, this is. This is the X hex where the plot really is. We smooched and ruined everything. <laughs> so, um, or actually, we had a very torrid summer affair that went badly. And uh, when both people involved are witches, sometimes you know, accidental cursing happens. When two witches get together, things happen. Exactly. So things wait, is happen. this your first Aaron Sterling book, or is Wife, up, is Wife Upstairs is as Rachel? Hawkins? Wife Upstairs is Rachel Hawkins. Yeah. So. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot we going a lot on. To get through. You have written we, how many books? I have had I've had eleven published books so far. Girl. So and then I have three more under contract. Yes, and then the wife upstairs coming out. So yeah, okay. there we go. And the wife upstairs comes out when? 
January, January 5th. So it's like actually not too far away. Like it sounds crazy to say in May, but you know how publishing is. Yeah. I'm like, oh, it's coming down the track now. Eight months. So, yeah, it's still, I feel like, well, I also felt like it was March. And then I got very right. confused when I found out it was May. And then I also thought yeah. it might be August. Like it's time. <laughs> And, and then Addie, Addie is in October for you, right? Addie is in October. Which is perfect timing for that book. I mean, you also talked about that book when we were in Edinburgh. Yeah. The Edinburgh script was really like. Addie and, is um, living a long time. Yeah, yeah. I remember that one and Savage Song, like both of those. I mean, I got Three. Long, a long burner. I have a long, yeah. a long burner. But no, I mean, it's great because. I mean, the world's on fire, and it will continue to be right. on fire. But, like, it was already going to be on fire in October because of the election, and we weren't going to move the book for yeah. that. So we figured, like, right. like, like yeah, we'll exactly. be in it. Plus, we need books. Like, the thing is, we need books, right? Now. This is what I keep telling myself, and I hope yeah. everyone else tells themselves, is that we need books, and we need escapism. Absolutely. And, we need, and weirdly, if I had to pick a book, to come out in October, I would pick Addie because it's this book about defiant hope. Right. It's like right. a joyful exactly. book. Yeah. It's just so weird. Yeah, anyway, okay, but this, is, this is the you show, not the me show. Oh, sorry, sorry. I like okay. to talk about you too, though. <laughs> I like so to wait. share. <laughs> we need to talk. So I have a, I have, excuse me, I have notes. This is a joke. Look at you. Um, that is professional. Very, thank God this is not a job because I am very bad at it. But, <laughs> I want to hear for everybody and for, for myself. Yes. Um, give walk us through your origin story. How do you get? Okay. How do you get to this to, to, to this game? To this game, to let's this game. see. Let's let's wind it back. So yeah, um, I used to teach high school English, and so when I got out of college, I taught preschool for a while, and then I was married, and my husband was a high school science teacher, and I just really kind of wanted like. His his job did not seem easy by any means, but I did like the schedule better than I liked mine, and I liked the money better, which is really sad. That tells you how much I was making teaching yeah. preschool. When I was like, oh, oh, teaching public high school, that's where the big bugs are. Broken system. Um, so yeah, it was it wasn't great, but um, but I didn't have a teaching certificate or anything like that. I just had an English degree, but I was able to get an emergency certificate. And which basically gives you three years to teach high school while you get your master's in education. Okay. So I was teaching high school. I was going to grad school at night and I had a baby in there because I was like, let's just do it all. Let's just, you know, why not? Um, grad school and also getting my certification through the state tangled up really badly after about three years. Like right when it was really important that it goes smoothly, yeah. it did not. And it was really frustrating, and I was really felt very hopeless and didn't really know what to do. And I had this thing where I was like, you know what, I've been teaching high school for three years. I've read a ton of YA, because I had not been reading YA before that. I mean, I had when I was a kid, obviously, and I was reading Harry Potter and stuff. But on the whole, the whole YA thing was passing me by until I started teaching. And then I was like, well, let me try my hand at this, because I really like this, and I think I could do it. And then, like, the whole idea was just, like, let me make enough money yeah. to, like, yeah. save my grad school stuff. Yeah. You yeah. And um, so I sat down, and I had to quit my job because of all the red tape and everything. And I wrote my first book, which was Hex Hall. And so, like, I was extremely lucky. Like, the timing was really, really good. First so, of all, I'm just gonna point out to everyone here, you your very first book that you wrote was Hex Hall, which is your first published book, which is not normal. Yes. It is not normal. It is not normal. I will say too though that I had been like half ass writing books for years, you know, starting and never finishing Did anything. You write fan fiction? Because I feel like that's also an education. Yes, a little bit. Not very much. But I think now when I look back, like a lot of the stuff that I was writing as a younger kid was fanfic, we just weren't calling it that. Because yeah. it was like the mid-90s and we didn't know about it. Um, or I didn't know about it. Yeah. So, yeah, so I wrote Hex Hall from like, and then it, it all happened really fast because also like 2008 in mm -hmm. young adult literature was like the freaking Wild West. Yeah. So there were, you know, a lot of books being published. Um, yeah. I wrote Hex Hall from October of 2007 to February of 2008. 
I signed with Holly, my agent, who's still my agent today. She was just a baby agent in 2008. I was a baby officer. So it was not just like running the world. I know. <laughs> so, she's such a baller. Um, so I got extremely lucky there. Like that was probably the luckiest break that I got in the whole thing was landing her right away. Yeah. And, um, and so, yeah, then she sold it to Disney Hyperion in a three book deal changed my life. I mean, you know, it was, I could, I could write for a living. Yeah. Um, again, that was the world of YA in 2008. I don't know. Those were the days where they were like, Those were the days. <laughs> Exactly. You've never written a book before, right? Three. I always, joke, I always joke that like creative industries are some of the only ones where we reward a lack of experience. Like you would never be like, here's your <laughs> debut surgeon. He's never like committed, like he's never like done a surgery before, but he's going to be great. <laughs> We're going to give him a million dollars for this a one. Lot of pressure. Right. And by like his 50th surgery, we'll give him 15 grand. <laughs> You so, can't hit those yeah. kinds of tree bombs until I until I empty this glass. <laughs> yeah, I know. So anyway, so yeah, that was kind of how, and then it all just sort of went from there. Um, so yeah, again, extremely fortunate. It's a real. It, it, it is not a story that would happen, I think, today. And that's not to like bum anybody out. It's just that like markets are weird, and I happen to hit at a very lucky. And to, market speak, to speak to the fickleness, because we now have both been in the industry for more than a yeah, decade, a like there are these hills and valleys where I sold a book like a year after you, and they were like, you want yeah. money? You <laughs> silly child. We don't pay yeah. money anymore. We pay too much money to all the 2008 people. Now none of the 2009 exactly. people can have money. Like <laughs> Exactly. And so, yeah, that was, it's been, so, yeah, I mean, that's the thing, like, it, it really was, it was the Wild West and, like, a gold rush in that sense, too, of, like, there's gold in them, there hills, okay, yeah. now there's no more gold, get the fuck out. <laughs> <laughs> and every now and then they're like, oh, we'll just make everything a movie deal, and then they're like, no, no more movie deals, we bought too many, like, it's just, you stay in, the thing yeah. is, and we both know Carrie Ryan, and Carrie Ryan yeah. has famously said to many of us, and I carry it in my heart, if you stay in this business long enough, everything that can happen everything will happen. Everything will happen to you. Exactly. All the good, all the bad, all the We've also had all the series that were a, that ended in a different way than we expected, or were abbreviated, yep. or we have had falling outs with publishers, or we have changed houses. I, somebody asked the mm -hmm. question, like, "How do you know when a publisher is the one?" And I feel like both of us would answer, "You do not," because you never no, do. Yeah. The one suggested it's a love pairing, and the fact is, it's a yeah. business. Absolutely. And it makes sense for like for both of you sometimes to move on and to shake things up yeah. and to try something new. Um, and yeah, so I mean, I've been a bunch now. But I feel like whether it's agents, like Holly is your first agent and she's my second agent, whether it's mm -hmm. publishers, I'm on like my fourth. Um, yeah. But I still am fond of most of them. Um, like no matter what it is, it, you know, like it, these are business things that we for some reason like filter through the language of fondness. And like you can yeah. care about your relationships, but they are business relationships. Exactly. And it's the most important thing to remember. Otherwise, you do get your feelings really, really hurt because it can feel and it, it's hard because art is personal, you know, like the publishing, like a lot of things is the merging of art and commerce. And like, that is where hearts break. There's no like oh, getting yeah. around. That. I remember um, seeing you after, after my, my Disney journey ended, shall we say. Yes. And I mean, I was heartbroken. I was like yeah. a baby lover for two years where I just kept sobbing uncontrollably at like the name, you know? Yeah, it was, it was really hard when I, I mean, my situation with like school spirits and all that was a little different and it was really yeah. complicated. It's one of those things that you can't even get into because it's like inside baseball and whatever. But it was, it was like, I remember months later after all that fallout being like, I'm still so sad. And my husband said, it's like you went through a breakup. You were in this relationship for like five years and now it's over and that is really hard to handle you know yeah i mean so. it's true and like that's the problem is it's impossible when we are dealing with the intersection of art and commerce to not also because we're making art to not also put pieces of ourselves and our hopes and our dreams and 
Especially right. because, you know, author with a capital A is something that like one in 10 people dream of being like, we grew up with these dreams and you, mm -hmm. you can't help but romanticize. And I feel like my entire calling in this industry is like de romantic it's like going around popping baby author <laughs> bubbles where I'm like, do you want to thank Poke? And I'm like, just trying to bring everyone a little closer to earth so they won't fall so far. I remember once, like, both of us, I think, got invited to the same, like, writer's retreat that was, like, all debut authors, yes. and both of us had not debuted yet, and both of us were like, we can't go, because it'll be, like, them, like, and this is my marketing plan that will surely happen, oh. and then I was like, it'll be, like, a cut to, like, the two of us, like, in fur coats and sunglasses, drinking vodka out of a bottle, being okay. like, no. I went to one, though, and it ended up being me and Carrie Ryan drinking white wine out of the bottles in the corner, because all of the baby authors were like, I'm special. It's not going to happen to me. And we were like, it's not it. It, it will to happen to everyone. Yeah. Okay, but we're here to talk about good things. So, yes, good things. Uh, okay, so Hex Hall. You get this yes. massive three book deal for Hex Hall. Yes. Mm -hmm. Gorgeous, wonderful series with the most beautiful Bulgarian cover I've ever seen. It's basically just a amazing. On Look at my Bulgarian Hex Hall cover, everyone. It's really something. I should have it framed in my house. It's like the craft meets Buffy, but with a spider on the belly button. Yeah, it's it's like a craft Buffy hybrid that was also a porno, quite frankly. <laughs> I aspired to one of those covers. I don't think I ever it's got beautiful. those. But you have no. this kind of dream beginning because, you know, Hexall yes. sells in so many countries. It gets yeah. a rabid fan base. Um, mm -hmm. Walk us through what happens after the arc, after that trilogy. Right. So then, like, you're always... So I, I wrote another paranormal YA trilogy, the Rebel Bell series, which did well, and yeah. I really love. But, of course, you're never going to capture that kind of lightning in a bottle. And also Rebel Bell, like, I'm still so thrilled that Penguin let me write those books because they're really weird. Like, well, looking back on them... Thank you. I think so. But I'm like, oh, God, this really was not... Like, and also by that point, like the market had changed, you know, and, and the thing with YA, and we've talked about this before, and you kind of touched on it earlier, there is kind of a like, who's new, who's new, who's new focus. So, so you have to sort of figure out how to adapt in that. Well, you um, went from being an extraordinarily successful debut author to really? an extraordinarily successful author, but there's a fetishizing of the debut that happens. And so they're like, exactly. okay, great, go with God. Yeah, and you're like, oh, okay, and like again, like I because I switched publishers for Rebel Bell, I feel like I escaped some of that because like they really did put a lot into it um, and all of that. But then I sort of took a break after Rebel Bell from YA for a little bit, and I, I did middle grade for two books, which again I'm really really proud of. Yeah, um, for Journey's End and Ruby and Olivia, both the books that I loved very hard to write though. Like middle grade was the hardest thing I've ever written. I do not think I'll do it again because we talked about that too at the time of like learning what yeah. your natural voice is and what is the farthest yeah. move from that voice. Exactly. And for me middle grade that was it. <laughs> I was kind of like I don't I don't know what they think is funny because my books are funny. Yeah. And so I had to bring funny to middle grade. So as a result, my middle grade is still funny I think, but it's also like my middle grade books are the saddest books that I've written. They're the, like, the, I poured the most sort of heart into them um, because I think I was trying to, I couldn't figure out the funny so much, but I could figure, I knew the heart at least. Well, your humor is like, I think for anyone in this chat who hasn't read your books yet, it's your natural humor is so close to you that I feel yes, like it is. it's hard then when, like, I felt like having, I met you and then I read Hex Hall like a year later and I was like, holy shit, is this just Rachel Hawkins like narrating yeah. a teenage novel? And so right, I think that yeah. can be difficult when you click, like it's so weird because like my first books were YA, but I clicked with the voice in adult. And then it yeah, made absolutely. it a lot harder to go back into YA and middle grade because I was like, oh, but, but like it just poured out when I wrote it this way and this way I'm having to think very carefully about what I'm doing. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so that was hard. Like, writing middle grade for me, I mean, I was lucky if I could get, like, 500 words a day on those books. Like, they were just slow going. Um, and again, the, the finished products, I ended up so proud of. Like, I really do. I think they're, like, some of the best books that I've written. 
because I had to spend so I couldn't sort of fall back on the original purchase. You worked too. so hard. I mean, the thing is, the books which yeah. are hardest for us are the ones where if you're a good author, if you're a dedicated author, that doesn't mean that you you like put half ass it. If anything, you go and you put right. five times as much work into making it good. <laughs> five times the ass. That should be yes. five ass. You five ass. <laughs> This is a full ass book. Yeah, that should be the tagline for my middle grade. Yeah. We'll see how that sells with <laughs> fourth grade librarians. So it says that this is a five ass book. What does what does that mean? Oh god, I'm gonna five ass all my books from now. Okay, on. Five, five ass all on the cover. Um, okay, I'm about to talk about my mandula. Here we go. I'm Another talking about mandula. Yes, because I pre-made some. <laughs> I want it to be prepared. I love you because so much. <laughs> I've also brought a small club soda. We're talking it up. This is this is joyful for me. Um, okay, so you wrote both middle grades. Yes. What came next? Then I wrote the Royals books, and yes. the Royals books, so Prince Charming and Her Royal Highness, which were my first contemporary YA books. And they are like my YA heart. You know, like this was like the, my absolute id. Um, it was very funny writing a book that wasn't paranormal because, like, everything else I'd written before that had been. Um, so, yeah, they are royal romances. They sort of let me get into, like, my celebrity gossip love. Um, they're rom-coms. Um, Her Royal Highness, in particular, let me tell a story between queer girls, which is yeah. what I had always... I wanted to tell, like, the fluffy, fluffy cliche written rom-com but, but yeah exactly. which i loved and appreciated so much because so often it's like it becomes an issue and like getting to right. in, getting to like have all the trashy shit that like the heteros get to have exactly. is very exciting for me yeah like, then that's what us, i wanted you gave us the like, same shit that the straights get like you gave us this you yes. gave us the good gay shit and i loved it mm -hmm. that is what i wanted to do and that's what i had said that's kind of how i pitched them which was that I was like, why don't queer girls get this shit too? Like, and they do, obviously. There, there's like, especially for like lately, like Lady Lady rom-com is like really yeah. exploding and it's so much good stuff. Um, but at the time that I started that several years ago, there yeah. wasn't as much. And I'm really, again, really, really thrilled that like Penguin was like, yes, go right. The gay girl. Right. It helps that my editor is married to a woman. So she was like, yeah. yeah. It helps. You had a good gay <laughs> gatekeeper. And like you should exactly. have, to have one of those, but it is a very good thing to have when like you right. yourself right. of a straighter persuasion. Right, exactly. Because that was the thing I was like, you know, one of the things we talked about was that I was like, I don't get into my own sexuality that much online. And I said, and, and at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because I'm married to a man. So for yeah. me personally, I was like, it presents it's this way. Sexually, it's it's what right. I call straight passing. It's exactly. And I'm like, it's, so that's, that's all that like, so I, I don't want to feel like I'm taking up anybody else's space or telling a story that's not mine to tell. Um, beautiful. Like, I got distracted because you're building the dick outside. Sorry. <laughs> like, what the was like, but, what's my soul holding a saw? Oh so. my God. <laughs> but it was beautiful. And it was, it's what I call casual queerness, which is this idea uh -huh. of like, it doesn't like, I love coming out narratives and they're super important, but not every narrative for queer people, like about queer people needs to be a coming out narrative because exactly. like, that's not the defining aspect. We just want to like have a queer existence. And so getting yeah. up, getting to take up that same space, um, it was such a delightful thing. Well, thank you. Cause I do, I love that book and it was a joy to write. And I've talked about this before, but it was really funny because I was sort of writing it in the wake of all the Me Too stuff. Mm -hmm. And I did not realize until I turned it in and my editor later came back and was like, we need to explain why this guy is the only boy at this all girls school and i'm like oh, oh my god it, it's not an all girls school it's a co-ed school i just forgot boys <laughs> <laughs> i'm just here for it like <laughs> yeah I was like let me put in some background penis then i'm so sorry but like i was so <laughs> was, it like, was, so set was it just some yeah. set so just some set dick yeah. penis just a little penis for atmosphere <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, wait, so how, I know, so I know, have known you long enough to know that, like, the adult books were in your heart, like, you, they you were talked about them for a long time. Yeah. So what happened? Okay, so it's one of those things where, like, the universe occasionally just opens up in a good way. Um, the Wife Upstairs, which is my first adult book, is actually a Right for Hire gig. 
So it's an alloy book. No, so sure. if anybody knows about like, alloy entertainment, yeah. they did like Gossip Girl and You, which is the big one for them now. Um, stuff like that. So they had just sort of sent out an email to our lovely agent, Holly, and they were like, we're looking to do this updated Jane Eyre. Yeah. And here's our idea for it. Do you have anybody who could possibly write this? And then halfway through their sentence, Holly was like, <laughs> I have somebody for you. Exactly. And this is why Holly is like the best agent in the world, because I had never written adult. I had never written thrillers, but she got that. And she was like, Rachel could probably do that. Yeah. Um, which is funny, too, because, like, you know, my background in, like, education or whatever, I don't have a lot of writing. Like, I didn't take very many creative writing classes. But my English degree is a literature degree, and my focus was Victorian British lit, and specifically, like, gender and sexuality in Victorian lit. Yeah. So I knew a lot about Jane Eyre, and I was like, okay, this, yes, this feels like something I could at least try to do. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I did like an audition for it mm -hmm. and it was very funny doing the audition because, and I know you've done the occasional write for hire thing yeah. too. And I had that same thing of like, do I give them what I think they want or do I give them how I would do this? Yeah. And I finally decided I had to give them how I would do it because that way if I didn't like it, yeah. And if they don't like it, you know, it, and my name is on it at the end of the day. Exactly. And I was like, if they don't like it then we just didn't have the same vision of the book. So when I did my little sample, you know, the most famous line from Jane Eyre is, reader, I married him. And I was doing my sample, doing my sample, and things occur in it. And I really wanted to end the sample on, reader, I fucked him. And I was like, do I do it? You do I not do it? And I did it. I did it. I yeah, I closed my eyes and, like, screamed. Like, ah! Go, because I was like, it's, it's I've got so that. You. It's so me, and I was like, you know, and if they're like, oh my god, no, this is not what we wanted, then fine. Like, but also, you then knew when they took it that you were gonna get yeah. to like write an authentic, just like you weren't. Because the problem is, if you had pulled back on that and they had bought it, right, you would have like every line you typed, there would have been a voice in the back of your head saying like, be careful not to X, right, not to y, not to Z. And that's not an interesting book. And that's not something I want to spend. I mean, you, you know how it is. Like, a book is going to take months, years of your life. Yeah. So you need to be committed to it. Um, and thank God, yes, they bought it. And they were like, yes, good. And they loved that. Like, that line yeah. is still in the finished book. God love it. Yeah. And, um, so, yeah, it came about like that. Mm -hmm. and, and it was very exciting. I had the best time working on it. Um, Alloy sort of helped me get a sample of it together. And we sold it to Sarah Canton at St. Martin's, who was just a dream editor for this project. Like, right. immediately got it, knew what we were doing. Um, and also in working with Alloy, like, when I went up to talk to them about the book, originally it was set, like, in Connecticut. They let me mm -hmm. set it in Birmingham, Alabama, because they were like, let's, you know, make it more authentic to who you are. Um, yeah, exactly. Lean in, which let me do a lot of fun stuff with sort of like gothic versus southern gothic, which I really liked. Um, so, yeah, so that happened. I've since sold another thriller to Sarah. It hasn't been announced yet, but like it's going to be really fun. I'm like, I'm, I'm still in secrets. Wait, so then how did Aaron Sterling happen? <laughs> so then. Living so many lives. The roller coaster of publishing. Um, after the Royals books came out, I really, really wanted to write a third one. Sales did not really justify that, which sometimes happens. They sold well, yeah. but it just wasn't quite what everybody was hoping it would be. And, you know, what can you do? And just for um, people listening to know, like, the weird yeah. thing about sales is, like, your book can be very successful, but in-house the publisher will create a metric, and, like, you're never yeah. told what that metric is, but if for some reason... Like, you can sell X number of copies, and if somebody else would be like, fuck yeah, X number of copies, and the publisher's like, yeah. mm, we were really hoping for, like, X plus two, and then they're like, oh, yeah. well. And so it's just, it's one of those times where the business reintersects the art in a really frustrating way. Exactly. I mean, like, and we both know of, like, examples where, like, you know, the book earns out, and they're still, like, the oh. yeah, exactly. It earned out, like, handily, and they were like, mm, that's really not what we were hoping it would do, and I was like, are you fucking serious? But, yeah. Neither here nor there. Um, so, yeah, on. So, so, yeah, it is not. And, and honestly, like, 
you know, I've been in this business a long time. I'm used to disappointments. They happen. There's good things, bad things. Yeah. That one, for whatever reason, it just broke my heart. It was just like, I, I didn't. And so I tried to write two other YA projects. My editor wasn't feeling either one of them, really. And the truth was, I wasn't really either. I just needed to sell a book, you know, and I was kind of doing the panic spiral. And, um, but then luckily, the wife up there sold kind of in the middle of all that. And that gave me some breathing room and then to really go. And so then I was very focused on the wife upstairs. And once it was in, so it, it, I turned it in last August, I had a moment of like, what do you really want to write? Mm -hmm. Because you're, you, I, I literally, I've never been out of ideas in my life. You know this about me. I am, a, I am an idea machine. I had nothing for Wyatt. It was like, I gave it time. I opened it. It was... Do you also, like, it, it takes a little bit of, of heart out, like when the thing that you want to write, you don't get permission to write, and then you try to give them other ideas, and they don't want those. It kind of yes. starts eroding your excitement for the creative process, and it can kind of create an empty well. Exactly, and that's exactly where I ended up, and I have this real, like, you know, come to Jesus talk with Holly, just sort of saying, like, None of us are going to get a good book out of this. You know, like, I can't wait for them to tell me what they want me to write. And, you know, they tried, and I tried, and it's not working. It's not them. It's not me. It's just that I don't have anything to give them. Yeah. And so they're going to keep reading that. You know, whenever I send them something, they're going to keep being like, eh, it's not quite there. It's because my heart is not quite there. Yeah, you need to um, find your joy again. Exactly. So I had seen a romance publisher... Um, talking on Instagram, because, you know, rom-coms are huge in romance right now, the kind of illustrated cover, trade paperback, rom-com, which I love. I've read tons of, the, I mean, I am an old school romance reader. You know, romance is like my genre. Um, so I've read it all. But I've enjoyed this kind of new wave of modern romance. And I saw someone on Instagram, I think it was Berkeley, be like, one thing we haven't seen is a paranormal rom-com. We're seeing a lot of rom-com submissions, but we're not seeing paranormal rom-com. Yeah. And I was like, oh, shit, I could do that. <laughs> That's like yeah. my whole universe, you know? And so I started really thinking about, like, what I wanted to write. And I had been trying to write a couple of romance novels, just like straight contemporaries. And it's funny because, like, when I look at them now, I see the ex-hex in them. Because I kept trying to tell this story about exes reuniting. And, like, what happens when you fall really deeply in love with someone really fast and it goes bad? And now, like, you're adults. Like, you were yeah. 20 when it happened. Now you're 30. What does that do? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so writing the X-Hex, I wrote, I worked on that from, like, August till October. I am convinced that that book sold because Holly, the genius that she is, sent the submission out the week of Halloween. So, like, the week of Halloween, Clutter. the most, Clutter. like, autumnal, like, witchy romance, everybody's drinking pumpkin spice and lighting jack-o'-lanterns book hit desks. I love it. <laughs> so, I love it. Did it go to Berkeley, or did it go... No, it did not go to Berkeley. Man, I talked to Berkeley, and I liked them an awful lot, but I went to Avon, which, okay. like, absolutely delighted me. And when um, is it coming out? It is coming out in fall of 2021. So I've got yeah, the one upstairs in January and then, yeah. And then like August, September. Yeah. So, so okay, yeah. you've got a lot on your plate and you've got yes. everything from middle grade to YA to adult and like yes. kind of this whole experiential docket. And, and, right. um, and like, I just want to know personally, like, because mm -hmm. I, I know we've written together like in the same space, but I feel like right. I haven't talked to you about this in a long time. Like, like, you know, I've had people on this, I almost called it a program, like I know what the fuck I'm doing, um, <laughs> who like are rigid outliners and people who just like fly by the seat of their pants. And I hate the yeah. plotter answer question because it's highly like, it's very reductive. But when yeah. you get an idea, like mm -hmm. what does the creative process look like for you? It's funny because it's changed an awful lot. Like it's evolved. And one of the things that changed it hugely is working with Aloy. And then after, oh, and I've also got a cereal box project coming out in the fall. <laughs> doing it all, Victoria. Doing it all. You just, I just, just it. And um, 
And both of those experiences, because Serial Box is collaborative, you know, you work within a writer's room kind of thing, and Alloy, which obviously is a work for hire type thing, um, I, I really changed. And I became much more into the outline, but a very, very loose outline. Okay. So now, now also, and we talked about this before, I know, when I get an idea, I do not immediately sit down and start writing. It, I really need at least a year, usually, of cooking mm -hmm. time. At least. Yeah. I've got some ideas that have been going for six or seven years. It's a smart um, girl, though, because you're testing, you're stress testing the idea, and you're letting it <laughs> rich in and get deeper. Exactly. The X-Hex is actually, it had the least amount of cooking time, because, again, I think I started it, like, I had the basic idea in August, and I had the sample out in October, which is really fast. Yeah. Then, again, when I looked back, and I was like, oh, for two years, I've been trying to write this book. Just, I didn't know the paranormal aspect, but I knew the, the exes thing. Yeah. Um, so now what I do is I, because when I worked with Alloy, you know, I, I went up to New York and we sat in a boardroom with like a huge whiteboard wall and we sat there for like nine hours yeah. and broke a book. Yeah. And it was like we hit every, you know, possible stumbling block there was and figured it out. And so, and then, you know, when I worked on it, they sent me like a big outline of like, here's what you do in this chapter. Here's what you do in that chapter. And on so the now one I do hand, that. It sounds like, like it would de romanticize the creative process. On the other hand, it sounds fucking delightful. To, like, it was amazing. It, it was the best. Like when I left that room, I mean, I felt like my, like I literally left and went straight to JFK. And it was like my brain was just leaking out of my ears. I was like, you could ask me to think of anything in that moment. I couldn't have my brain have been in such overdrive. Yeah. But at the same time, it was so, especially because thrillers, like, I had always been very much of like a sort of pantser and like, oh, just right here and right there. But when I started writing thrillers, you just can't because the the structure is such a vital part of the yeah, thriller. Yeah, you're playing with red herrings, you're playing with false leads, you're playing with, like, twists, and it's really hard to just... I mean, I know a couple thriller writers, like, J.T. Ellison doesn't really plan, and I'm like, you're a thriller yeah. writer, but, like, on the whole, but, most of us mere mortals need to Right, I was like, but J.T. Ellison's kind of a god, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah, like, so for me, especially because with, with thrillers, I always feel like, the reader has to be one step ahead of the characters and the author has to be at least two steps ahead of the reader. Where and that is that? because you want the reader to always feel smarter than the people in the book. The, the reader has twigged to what's going on yeah. um, and is like, you dumbasses, you're going to get murdered. And that's like a satisfying feeling when you're reading yeah. a thriller. But then you um, as the writer kind of trick them. And then you have to trick them. them. That's a very, and, very good way to put that. It's almost yeah. like you're a writer. Like, these are just gems of wisdom. I'm just saying. I've been doing it for a while. So, yeah, yeah. so now um, I definitely, I, I never worry about things like, like the idea itself or dialogue or even, like, sort of settings. Hold on. My, my thing is unstable. There we go. <laughs> and, um, but I have to really think about structure. And, again, writing thrillers forced me to think about structure in a way that I had not really had to before. And that's something that I then carried over into writing romance. Mm -hmm. So now we'll sit down before I really get started. I let something cook for a really long time. And that just, you know what I mean, like, but for those of you who don't, um, I just turn it over in my head constantly. So it's just, it's always with me. I'm always, if there's a song that reminds me of it, I think about why. I think about it before I go to bed. You know, it's just turning yeah. it over. Frequent, um, viewer, frequent viewers of this weekend program yes. will know that I refer to something called the six burner stove method, which is the idea uh -huh. that while you have one thing on really high heat, the thing you're actively writing, you have four to five things on really low heat and you're continually yeah. stirring. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what it feels like. Um, and then I sit down with index cards and I literally, because <clears throat> for me, uh, my chapters tend to be short. I like to hit a high note each chapter. And so, and by this point, I know that I tend to work at about 35 chapters on a first draft. So I get 35 index cards, yeah. and I, I just write, here's the high note, here's the high note, here, you know, and, and so I can sort of see the um, arc. Um, I usually write out of order for, like, half the book, because I, I know what the scenes are going to be. Um, and then there just comes a point where, you know, you have to 
Do you write the scenes it. you want to write? Like, is it yeah. that you pick the scenes you want to write? Because I'm the exact same way. I pick the scenes I want to yeah. write that day because I'm like, fuck it, whatever it takes to get through the draft. But also, it's because I think, I'm going to, I give like a professional answer to this, which is that we're in different emotional states on different days. And some days, yeah. it's not just that I'm in the mood to write one thing. It's that maybe I'm better emotionally equipped to write X or Y or Z, like a vulnerable yeah. scene or a sex scene or whatever it is. Yeah, it's funny because like with the romance, like I have two sex scenes that need to be finished. Like I've just, I, these poor people, I've just left them <laughs> at the brink as it were. And I just haven't been in the right heads. And I was like, it's because I write in the morning. Yeah. And I was like, and 7 a.m. is just a really weird time to get freaky with it, apparently to me. I mean, obviously no shame to people who, you know. <laughs> I but feel like it's just not your, you need to like pour yeah. yourself a glass of wine in the evening and just get, oh, no, so the so listen to the right music. And then I, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, that's part of it. And I also, um, and I've talked about this online before, but there was a writer, there is a writer, Juliana Baggett, who wrote a blog post once where she talked about that, where she was like, writing is so hard. And there are so many times we do not want to do it. So if you're excited about writing something, just fucking write it. Exactly. Why would you put it off when you actually feel joy? It's true, though. And people are it's like, so oh, I withhold, like, so I make myself wait to write that scene. I'm like, you're also probably the asshole who, like, would have left the Oreo on the plate to get an extra <laughs> Oreo. Like, I, I don't have that level of, of either control or interest in being control. Like, I just want to write no. the scene I want to write because the more of the book I have written, the less likely I am to quit writing it. So like exactly. whatever it gets to, the, to the finish line. That is for me because I, I don't know how you so like where do you sit on like the do you prefer drafting or editing? I mean like it's like do you prefer having your teeth pulled out or getting a bikini wax? But like <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um do you have a creative kryptonite? Like do you have a part that either you dread or you hate or you're scared of or the thing that is always something that you have to face in each draft? I mean, there's always, like, like a hinging plot chapter that I will put off forever, because I'm like, oh, that, that chapter has to do so much heavy lifting, it has to do this plot thing, this emotional thing, this character beat, you know, so those tend to be the last chapters I put in. Got it. Um, so, yeah, so, like, uh, that's why I, I prefer editing to drafting, because... Me too. Even though editing is scary, and like you've talked about before, how it's like moving a house brick by brick, hoping that it stays, you know, it makes it better. Yeah, back into the left. And then you're also doing that thing of like, <laughs> is it better? Or is it different? Which is it? Yeah. I'm not used to talking this much. My voice oh, sorry. Is I know it's this. We have quarantine voice, which is what happens when you are not used to talking for long periods of time, and then you consume solely alcohol while you talk. <laughs> also, I can't believe we're 50 minutes into this, and I feel very guilty about that because this is only just around like 50 minutes. But I'm not quite done with you yet, so you have to put up with. No, it's fun. We we really though we're genuinely very good friends. We're talking yeah, about I'm getting a few notes though that your microphone has been a little muffled since you moved your camera. Can you okay. move your camera a little closer to your face, and we'll do a tiny. Yeah. Here, actually, I can just hold it now. Oh, per you are perfect now. You are perfect now. Um, you my so soda. I want to talk to you about my favorite topic because it's, I'm terrible at this. Do you have any work-life balance? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I do because I have to because mom, you know, <laughs> and and so like I've said before with like being a mom and being a writer I get and you know women get this all the time like this shit from not this question this question's good but like the question from you know men usually of, like how do you possibly do it all and part of it is like have a good partner yeah. or a good support system um it, it's hard my thing is like it's always got to tilt towards life I'm always going to do the Stephen King thing of, what is it, how is it he puts it, like, art should be a support system for life, life should not be a support system for art. And that is something that I really try to remember, because I do, I have a kid and I have a family, and that's not to say that, like, having a kid is the only thing that makes your life worth living. <laughs> no, 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 but it is a, it's a necessary counterpoint. It's not an optional counterpoint. Like, it's not a, right, like, exactly. you're not like, I knit. You're like, well, I have another human who, right. and like, like, is independent. 
And I was like, and this is like literally like the one thing on earth I cannot fuck up. Everything else I can fuck up and it's okay. Yeah. But like I'm raising a young white man in 2020 and so it's very important that yeah. I'm not fuck that up. Well, you also um, seem to be like very like you're you're always posting pictures of very delicious food that you're cooking yes, and there's I love like, there are other aspects here i will tell you the best piece of parenting i have ever witnessed in my <laughs> life was from you and your yeah. husband i was staying with you like yes. eight years ago seven years I ago and you and yeah because like because your child had to be like five so how did yeah. you it had to be like 10 years ago. Anyway, and yeah. you and John were watching a very scary program on the television, like a ghost hunter show. And right. your son came in awesome and yeah. he was like, this is scary. I don't want to watch it. And you and Jay both turned to him and said, there's another television in this house then. Like, yeah. you <laughs> wanted to come in and you were just like, get like shit or get off the pot, kid. Like, yeah. you're going to sit and watch this program or you're going to go find your own. Like, right. Yeah, exactly. Like, no, like, we're not, especially because by that point it was like late in the evening. Yeah. So, or like, you know, it was getting close to his bedtime. So it was just, it was like, there's, there's, another tv there we literally had like two living rooms at that time I it was bonded like, yeah. because also we're only children you and, mm -hmm. I, and you've made an yeah. only child yes this is that was a lot of it is like we will accommodate you up to a point but yeah. like if we're watching something and it's not like it's inappropriate it's not like people are getting shot no, in the head or <laughs> yeah and you don't want to watch it, like, when you're going to go need to find something else to do because you don't run this bitch. I have never <laughs> felt so seen, like, up until that moment, I was like, I can never have a child. And then I saw that, yeah. and I was like, maybe I just have to have the right kind of child. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the you don't run this bitch is, like, a really important thing no. <laughs> to let kids know. I would yeah. agree. Um, okay, we're running out of time, so I have one last question. I can't wait to ask you this because it's the meanest question that I have. Yay. Okay. So I was at a conference and I met an actor and the actor essentially was there for a show he was currently on and almost everyone that came through his line was for a movie that he did when he was in high school. And we had oh, this conversation. Oh, is it Yeah, this is Steve. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so, and we were talking about the fact that you don't get to pick what you're known for. So yeah. here's my question is like, if you could only pick one of your books to outlive you, to be the book yeah. that people read, would, would yeah, you, no. what would you pick? And it's okay if it's one that you haven't written yet, you can say that. But if you feel like you've written a book that you would be happy if it outlived you, then that has to be your answer. Honestly, it's weird because like I'm going with like what my heart said, you know, my immediate answer is actually Journey's End, which is so funny. I know, you'd think I would say Hex Hall or one of the Royals books, but Journey's End, in the end, had the most of my heart in it. You know, it's my Scotland book. I mean, the Royals books are set in Scotland too, but that's my like John O'Groats. Um, it's also like a book that I didn't realize I was like writing about my dad in a lot of ways. Yeah. And I think it's like a sweet book. You know, like, there's a, there's an awful lot. I My sense of humor tends to be a little caustic and sarcastic and all that. But I was like, oh, that's right. Like I do have like a secret squishy center. Maybe not that secret. Um, <laughs> And so, yeah, I think it's that one. I do. I think that, like, as hard, the, the hardest book I ever wrote. Like, I did not enjoy writing it. I <laughs> talked to you many times while you were writing it, and you were like, why I, did I choose to write this? I How did not are? enjoy writing it, but I love the finished product so much. So, yeah, that one. That. That's the one I love. Yeah. I love it. Well, now everybody who's watching this who hasn't read Journey's End yet knows that they have to go and pick up Journey's End. Read that End. one. Can yes. You end by just giving us like the elevator pitch for it. Yes. Yeah, so Journey's End is about a small village in Scotland where people occasionally disappear into magical fog, and one day a boy who disappeared a hundred years ago comes back. So what you gonna do now? <laughs> I love it. I love it, Rachel. You are one of my favorite people in this entire world. I right back at you, my love. I miss day. you so much. Thank you for day drinking with me. Thank you to everybody. Ooh. <laughs> who came out and, and listened to us both kind of shit talk and on the talk about publishing for the last hour. Um, just so everybody knows, this will be up on the Instagram channel for the next 24 hours, and then it will live over on my YouTube page as an archived video because J.D. Hovland, who's an amazing, amazing uh, listener and reader, is, is nice enough to assemble those videos for me. 
So that's right. We still live forever. We are immortalized, not only through our as we should be very informal <laughs> Saturday night slash Saturday day drinking stories so that I made up one day. So thank you, Rachel. Well, I, thank you so much for having me. It was a I joy. I can't wait to read the White House stairs and X Hall. And I'm just saying that when they're done, like you have my email. Yeah, well, you know, you could probably get a wife upstairs from Holly. I'm just saying. It's done. So. I'm probably. Yeah, just, but I want, I also want X, I want X Hex when it's done. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's my Monday. Idea. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. And thank, thank you so you. much, Rachel. Now go. Ooh, this was such a good time. Good effect and go, like, go write something. Go work I'll write the sex scenes. Yeah, it's time to write the sex scenes, everybody. It's the perfect <laughs> time to write the sex scenes. Two men juleps equals a sex scene. A sex scene. Win win. Oh, I love it. I love you. I hope I get to see your face love in person soon. Have a wonderful oh, rest of your day. Bye. Bye, everybody.